I would like to just okay. show you a PPT which I made about five years ago for a CME talk on Ether Day. I don't know whether I have shown it earlier or not. I'll just quickly go to that. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. So, um, in most cases, actually, the description, I'll go through rapidly because we have a very limited time. The uh, definition, we may ask you what is coagulation or hemostasis. It's a process in which a series of reactions occur among coagulation protein to finally end up in conversion of soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin stands. This is the actual definition of coagulation. So you want ultimately the fibrinogen, which is a protein in the blood, to become, which is sol which is uh, dissolved in the blood to become insol insoluble fibrin stands. So the actually it is a uh, this is how the whole thing happens, one pushing the other. And the purpose of coagulation is to maintain a balance between pro and anti-coagulation pathways. This is a very, very important step in the nature. Otherwise, all of us will be having a traumatic uh, lesion somewhere or other. So in a normal, healthy vascular tree, you should have no thrombus formation when the blood is flowing. So the blood should not be allowed to clot. If it clots unnecessarily without any injury, it results in thrombus formation. So it is very important that we have a good balance between the pro and anti-thrombotic pathways. And uh, the components involved, vascular endothelium, as we rightly said, which is the most intimate thing, it has got an intima, media, and the uh, adventitia. <coughs> So the intimal layer is made up of endothelium, which has got all this uh, nitric oxide and other things. Then there is a media which forms the uh, uh, matrix, extracellular matrix. So that is this uh, matrix should be exposed by the removal or the loss of this endothelium when there is a damage. Then only the platelet will get added. As we rightly said, the endothelium has got a negative charge, which will not allow. Because the first step in clot formation is the platelet should come and stick to that place of injury. That is the basic thing. So normal platelets will not be allowed to come and sit on the endothelium because of the negative charge they have. And platelets also have negative, so like charges repel. So that is how it is. Uh, nature has made it in such a way that it will be causing this. And this collagen and macrophages, all these things, when they are exposed, one willibrand factor is the one which attracts and brings the platelet to the area. So second thing is platelets. And platelets, they are made from the uh, macrophages, uh, megakaryocytes rather, and they are devoid of nucleus, just like the RBCs. And that is why they have a very short and life of uh, four to seven days. And uh, the, these are all the uh, coagulation factors which are in the plasma. This is the third component. So vascular endothelium, platelet, plasma clotting factors, these are the three things which are involved in the coagulation pathway. And the mnemonic to remember the clot factors are pressure party tonight, come let us sing, also call seniors, please have fun. So F is fibrinogen, P is prothrombin, and T is, as you see in the earlier thing, uh, tissue thromboplastin, and uh, CUM is, uh, I think, uh, sorry, calcium, and uh, the L is labile factor, S is stable factor. Like that, you can remember all these uh, 13 factors with this mnemonic. Now, coming to the vascular endothelium in a healthy, intact, there is an anti-thrombotic uh, mechanism. We don't want the thrombus formation in an intact food vessel. So there, there are three, say, so many things which are important. And it is heparin sulfate, not heparin sulfate, which is a, a has an anti-thrombin-free factor, which uh, prevents any clot formation. 
So these four factors, thrombomodulin, heparin sulfate, tissue plasminogen activator, CD90, all these things prevent the platelet coming anywhere near the endothelium and getting stuck. So this is the antiplatelet effect, negative charge repelling platelets by synthesis of prostacycline, nitric oxide, ADPase, anticoagulation effect by these mechanisms, heparin C and uh, as well. But when it is injured or dramatic, it becomes co-thrombotic. You can see here, there is a damage in the endothelium. The endothelial cells are lost. You can find here also there is a damage, vessel wall injury is there. So immediately platelets come and get stuck there. Platelet gets activated, then more platelets come, which is called aggregation. The initial step of platelet aggregation is the sticking of platelet to the injured wall. That should be called aggregation. It should not be called aggregation. And once they get adherent to the injured wall, they get activated, which becomes then starts the aggregating more platelets. Okay? So exposure to extracellular matrix, subendothelial space as collagen, von Willebrand factor, and plat platelet adhesion glycoprotein. And tissue factor which initiates glycoprotein coagulation is the expressed from fibroblasts in the ex extracellular membrane. Why it is called extra path, extrinsic pathway? Because it is outside the lumen of blood vessel. So these factors exist outside, not in the flow. Inside the lumen, it is not there. That is why it is called extrinsic. It is not extrinsic to our whole body. It is extrinsic to the lumen of the blood vessel, but within the other layers of blood vessel. And coming to platelets, they are derived from this. They are uh, non-nucleated and they have three methods of uh, this is how the formation is happening from stem cell it goes into the colony forming units and all then there is a pro megakaryoblast megakaryoblast pro megakaryocytes and then finally platelets now how do they get adhered to that see once you to <coughs> vascular injury is there one willibrand factor is the bridging molecule between the extracellular matrix and platelet GP1B receptor. That is the first step. And this factor is uh, very loosely bound there. It is not strongly bound there. And that is called the primary plug or hemostasis. And uh, if it is not strong enough, it will uh, cause further bleeding. So once when the platelet gets attached to that, it gets activated. And the platelet has got two types of granules. One is called the dense granule, another is called the alpha granule. And from there, these factors are all released, which help to attract more platelets and cause the aggregation. So this step is very important. Only when this activation happens, it will attract more cells and cause activation. So this is how the aggregation happens. When platelets get activated, they attract more platelets. And in addition, two surface receptors of platelet membrane, that is GP, 2B, 3A are expressed. And these are the receptors we target when we put a patient on anticoagulation therapy, that is a uh, uh, dual antiplatelet agents, we normally call it as aspirin and clopidogrel or ticagrel or prasugrel. All these things are acting at this particular receptor level in the platelet. So that forms a secondary hemostatic plug by the aggregation of further platelets. Then the plasma protein <coughs> coagulation. They are synthesized mostly in the liver. Only these three factors, that is factor 8, factor 3 and one willibrand factor are not produced in the liver. And factor 6 has been removed from the uh, list. If you see, it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then seven, eight, like that. Six will not be there because it was found to have been identified earlier and given another number. So like, again, somebody else uh, included it. And because both were same, it was removed. And they have used only Roman numerals for uh, giving the number for the coagulation factors. And we should not write one, two, three, four, like that was one normal way. And uh, again, these are all the uh, various characteristics of blood clotting factors and they are present in the plasma protein. Most of them are plasma protein. Most of them are produced in the liver. 
but factor 3 is produced in the tissue that is tissue factor which is responsible as in the cascade extrinsic pathway then some of them are produced in the liver as well as platelets some of them are anti hemophilic factor is produced in the lung capillaries also and factor 13 is produced in bone marrow also so these are the important things and how they help in the various process is also given so this is the what is called the classical pathway the extrinsic intrinsic and final common pathway is called the classical pathway which was originally described and this is the various steps by which it comes to um, <coughs> activation the damage surface activates initially <coughs> sorry tilinogen and calicrit and uh, makes all the dormant inactive plasma proteins into active proteins so once a 12 becomes 12a it is means it is active similarly 11 becomes 11a means it has become active so 9 when it becomes 9a it is again active like that it gets activated and then the most important factor is the 10a and through this 10a only the common pathway starts and finally it has to end up in conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin and cross link that uh, fibrinogen To, uh, to make it more stronger if it remains just as a fibrin clot it will get dissolved and when fibrinolysis occurs they break this cross link and uh, imagine you building a house you put uh, the bricks one by one without a cement that is the initial stage of fibrin clot but if you put a cement and then put the bricks over it it will get stuck so that like that so cross linking means it is making it more stronger and uh, the breakage is done by the <coughs> fibrinolytic plasminogen so this is how the injury happens when there is a contact then all these things very simple way to remember this pathway and uh, pitfalls of this uh, classical pathway is described using in vitro methods they tried it all in the test tubes all the uh, testing was done with the laboratory in the test tube and it failed to reveal the role of factor 7 in the integration of extrinsic and intrinsic pathway in vivo how it is happening in the body it failed to reveal it also offers no explanation as to how deficiency of factor 12 does not cause undue bleeding and why in hemophilia there is no support by the thrombin form to control bleeding all these questions were not answered by this older method so hence the current concept of cell mediated pathway the cell based mediated or pathway was proposed by this lady marine hoffman in 2001 and all reactions are said to take place on the surface of two different types of cells namely the platelets and cells with tissue factor this is the basis for this particular thing they say they are cell based because these cells these two different types of cells are responsible for the entire coagulation pathway and those cells are platelets and cells with tissue factor the cells which have this tissue factor are fibroblast and smooth muscle cells and occurs in three phases which overlap each other that is the next component so what are the three phases here there is a initiation phase where there is a damaged tissue as factor bearing cell and that reacts to cause all these changes then there is amplification and propagation so if you, these are all the various factors that are used so initiation tissue factor plays a major role in the association of factor 7 in attracting platelets also triggering plasma mediated reaction then there is an amplification where activation of factor 10 leads to thrombin generation from prothrombin to and propagation more thrombin is generated instead of saying more aggregation of platelets here the propagation is by more thrombin generation so this is one easy way to remember the steps first you write the, the target which is factor 10 by putting an x okay this is how first step second step you write the numbers from 12 to 8 and exclude 10 because you already put 10 here write the numbers from 12 to 8 So 12, 11, 9, and 8 are written. That is the step number two. Step number three: write factor seven, which is the extrinsic factor pathway, and 
step four is draw the common pathway where you have to write one into two into five is equal to ten. So these are the one is fibrinogen, two is prothrombin, five is the other factor. With all these things, the common final pathway comes. So this way you can remember all the steps of the original classic pathway. Now applied physiology, non willebrand factor definitely causes bleeding due to failure of primary hemostasis. As I said, because platelet is attracted only by the presence of von willebrand factor in the extra, uh, extracellular matrix area. And platelets can be deficient in number or in function, which can also lead to play failure of clot formation, resulting in excessive blood loss. And plasma coagulation factor deficiency results in failure of progression of clotting cascade leading to blood loss. Now, failure of anticoagulant factors or excess of procoagulant factors can lead to thrombus formation. So, why we develop thrombus inside is we are not preventing the coagulation. The anticoagulant factors are not there, or the procoagulant factors are more. Primarily, it is the deficiency of antithrombin 3. Protein C, protein S are the common causes. Uh, and excess of antiphospholipid antibodies and homocysteine also promote thrombosis. That is why nowadays we always check people who have a tendency for developing atherosclerosis or thrombotic even. We are now checking homocysteine routinely in all the uh, <coughs> evaluation. Rarely primary thrombosis. Uh, cytemia, where the platelet count is abnormally high, can also cause spontaneous thrombosis. Now, when you want to evaluate the coagulation status, you have to do history taking, lab based test, point of care test. So, when you want to take the history, you must conduct the carefully taken history, is more than enough to assess the coagulation status. That is why. Uh, when Rao completed that uh, always uh, testing is not required because we can always find out a carefully taken history will help to assess the coagulation status. And the alteration of coagulation may be in the form of either undue bleeding tendency or a tendency for thrombus formation. These are the two antagonistic uh, conditions that can happen. So what questions you will ask for evaluating whether they have anti bleeding disorders. For that, you must ask for excess of history of bleeding during either trauma or a previous surgery, need for any blood transfusion because of this bleeding or re-exploration to control bleeding. For example, a child not properly evaluated post transfusion bleed. Even after exploration, if it continues to bleed, then only you think of some coagulation deficiency. So that will give a good clue. Frequent spontaneous epistaxis. The patient who has a previous history uh, of epistaxis, you have to do the bleeding uh, uh, testing. And oral bleeding during routine brushing or during any dental procedure. In female patients who have severe menorrhagia or postpartum hemorrhage, spontaneous hemorrhage into joints, like in cases of hemophilia or age of occurrence what is uh, because in the age group you always take more care history of drug intake aspirin intake or nsaids herbs fish oil garlic this garlic is very important because people who take garlic regularly it almost acts like an antiplatelet agent and causes more bleeding and coexisting diseases like renal hepatic thyroid and bone marrow disorders or malignancy so these are the questions you have to ask if the patient is having a bleeding type tendency on the contrary if the patient is having a thrombotic tendency is the patient obese obese patients as you know have tendency for venous thromboembolism and is the patient undergoing an orthopedic or major abdominal surgery where they can be recumbent for quite some time or if the patient has oral contraceptives. Ladies who take oral contraceptives, they have tendency for thrombus formation. And is the patient pregnant? Pregnant is a pregnancy is a procoagulant, it's a thrombotic state. And the patient being immobile for long, history of malignancy or on chemotherapy, which is also pro thrombotic, or history of prior DVT, history of angina, or history of previous stroke. All these things indicate that the patient has got thrombotic tendency. 
Now, what are the indications for lab test? If preoperative history reveals significant symptoms of bleeding disorder, you have to do lab test. In cases where major surgery with possible chances of bleeding is amputated, like uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, you have to do lab test. Or in patients who are not able to provide a bleeding history, but you would suspect clinically to find whether it has a bleeding or thrombosis, then also you have to do this test. Now, if any bleeding disorder or thrombotic tendency detected preoperatively, underlying mechanism must be ascertained before proceeding with surgery, especially in elective cases. Now, lab-based measurements, which he mentioned, so lab platelet count is the first and foremost lab-based technique that uh, test that you do, and uh, what are the various ranges at which it causes the bleeding, and uh, the second test is bleeding time because it uh, uses the platelet function. Earlier, we saw the quantity of platelet in the blood. Bleeding time tells about the quality and functional status of the platelet in primary hemostasis. And uh, it is a very simple method. Just by pricking the hand and then timer is used and you start uh, uh, applying a blotting paper and you can see the a decrease in the clot formation and stopping of bleeding. So this is how the bleeding time test is done in the lab. And uh, the prothrombin time helps to assess the extrinsic and common pathway. So value expressed in four ways, either with the PT as the control value or PT as INR or PT ratio or PT index. These are the four ways it is done. And this is the method how it is done. You can take a separated plasma because plasma only contains all the coagulation factors. Once you remove the coagulation factors, it becomes serum. So the separated plasma, which is preventing the coagulation, to which you add calcium and thromboplastin and then see the <coughs> action of all these things to find out the time it will start plotting. And, uh, INR is introduced a standardized, which you mentioned, because the addition of uh, the tissue factor in that is uh, different from various labs. So, various standards of tissue factor are used in different labs. So, in order to standardize, INR is calculated by the following way. That is, uh, PT test by PT control into the standardization. That is also to be, ISA is a numerical value representing the responsiveness of any given commercial agent related to the international standard. So that is the correct formula. PT test divided by PT control multiplied by ISI. And the normal value is 0.8 to 1.2 seconds. And the fourth thing, APTT, which is also a test of intrinsic and common pathway. Normal value is 35 to 35 seconds. Abnormal value indicates deficiency of most of the coagulation factors except factor 7, which is tissue factor, which is responsible for extrinsic pathway. And for this, again, you take the citrated plasma and then add calcium, kaolin, phospholipid, and then you do the coagulation screening. That is how the whole thing starts. And the third fifth thing is the thrombin time, which helps to test the function of status of thrombin and fibrinogen. Normal range is 15 to 19 seconds. And this uh, thrombin time test bypasses factors 2 and 12, measures rate of fibrinogen conversion to fibrin. And procedure is add thrombin with patient plasma, measure the time to clot. And the source of uh, variable factors in this testing are the how you obtain the thrombin that also modifies the value. Now the repulase time is done when PT is prolonged. This is only this test is the uh, additional test to be done if you find the thrombin time is abnormally prolonged. You have to distinguish the following condition. If the PT alone is raised with a normal repulase time, it indicates excess of heparin in the blood. If you have raised a thrombin as well as raised replace, it indicates low fibrinogen or fibrinogen degradation product. And the normal value for replace time is 14 to 21 seconds. And as he said, it is a uh, barotoxin, barotoxin, which is uh, taken from this uh, snake. That is what is added and this uh, 
uh, this is because it's a reptile it is called reptile snake and uh, anti 10a factor such a is used monitoring the activity of low molecular weight heparin and indirect uh, 10a activities which also he mentioned and uh, fibrinogen level is very important especially in postpartum hemorrhage this is a very important test to assess the uh, success of your treatment normal range is 160 to 350 mg per deciliter so more than 350 is a normal range 160 to 350 is good less than 160 is dangerous and this could be due to reduced production uh, by hereditary or hypofibrinogenemia or liver disease or it can be due to increased consumption as happens in dac and fibrinolysis test of fibrinolysis they are dissolved a lot from products and one component of this is the d dimer which has a 2d fragments of fibrin protein joined by cross link and the ppp value increases in advanced liver disease or exogenous thrombolysis like prostokinase dac or during cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, d dimer values increase in dac dvt and pulmonary embolism and d dimer is also important in anaphylaxis when you have a, a anaphylaxis you are supposed to uh, take uh, blood and keep it there assess it for tryptase and d dimer which are indicator of anaphylaxis so the only way we can prove anaphylaxis is by uh, the presence of tryptase and d dimer and just as the tests are done to assess the bleeding tendency some tests are done to assess the thrombotic tendency also so thrombophilia can be inherited or acquired which are called factor 5 laden mutation prothrombin gene mutation deficient thrombin c s and z anti thrombin deficiency all these things are anticoagulant factors if they are not deficient then you will have coagulation or thrombosis and acquired conditions can be detected by anti phospholipid antibodies estimation of homocysteine level as i said earlier and uh, <coughs> i mean so these are the uh, these uh, four earlier things are all lab based and uh, because why we wanted to to show to point of care or bedside uh, testing is the drawback of lab based test is to reduce the time delay especially in trauma when there is a severe hemorrhage and we want to do transfusion you want to assess the coagulation patient is going on bleeding every time sending the blood to the lab and waiting for the results so i have such a time delay in the treatment so that is the first reason second reason avoiding testing of plasma at a standard temperature so you always uh, take it to the standard temperature and do you do it in situ as it is and lack of information on platelets majority of the blood, unless you do a specific platelet count or the platelet uh, uh, functional assay you will not be able to find the real status so advantages of point of care testing results are provided faster less volume of whole blood is used here here mostly we use the citrated plasma whereas here we can take the blood and directly use it Uh, in the uh, in the put it in the machine and you require hardly 0.3 0.5 ml or not more than that and less transportation hazards and helps in blood component and drug therapy and uh, it is presently available to us they can classify them into monitoring heparin anticoagulation measuring the intrinsic ability of the blood to form clot or you can assess the viscoelastic properties of coagulation and platelet function monitors also have now come as a bedside or point of care testing machine and clotting factor tests are also now available so all the four things have been included into the bedside assessment so functional assay of monitoring heparin and coagulation which is commonly as an activated clotting time those who have then um, cardiac pulmonary bypass surgery or cardiac surgery are very familiar with that and uh, it is uh, low advantages are low cost simple operation all these things you know and this is the machine which uh, displays the time so we want to 
raise it to two or three times before the cannulation in cardiopulmonary bypass surgery is by giving heparin. So it is mainly to monitor the heparin anticoagulation as the activated clot in time. The second thing is high dose thromb in time which is another functional assay of heparin anticoagulation and prolongs duplex the anticoagulation by heparin. The third, uh, viscoelastic measures of coagulation are thromboelastography analyzes and displays all stages of clot formation right from the beginning to resolution. So at what time exactly the liquid blood becomes a semi-solid clot and then how it becomes a firm clot, then how it breaks down into again a liquid clot. All these stages are analyzed, analysis in the interaction between platelets, fibrinogen and coagulation and factors use only 0.35 ml into two cups and gives a cigar shaped graphical display and this is the thromboelastography and you can see this is how the whole thing uh, so the here the pin is stand, uh, the rotating inside a cup and then the uh, you get a graph like this so the reaction time from where the clot forms the kinetic clots then there's the angle the maximum amplitude and then it starts breaking lysis up to that. So coagulation and fibrinolysis all are measured in this. Then egg values are interpreted and what is the correction you need. If the R time is prolonged, this is a viva question or your hospital uh, question also. So the egg value R prolonged coagulation factor problem, plasma you have to transfuse. If it is a decrease in alpha angle, just to Give you this. This is the alpha angle. This is the. So just remember these words here. This is the reaction time. This is the achievement of certain firmness of clot. This is the alpha angle. This is the maximum amplitude. So based on that, decrease in alpha angle means no thrombin and fibrinogen. So you have to give cryoprecipitate, <coughs> or you can give fibrinogen also nowadays, which is available. Uh, Decrease in maximum amplitude, that is the strength of the thing, which means it's a decreased platelet function. That is, so unless uh, more platelets aggregate, you will not get a maximum amplitude. So, platelet transfusion and uh, DDAP, uh, which is uh, activator of platelet, can be given and raise the estimated percentage of lysis. You have to give tranexamic acid or. So these four things can be detected, whether it is a coagulation factor deficiency, whether it is a thrombin deficiency or fibrinogen deficiency, platelet or paralysis. And the rotation thromboelastography is a modified version of earlier introduced. So TEG was introduced first, then it was changed into rotation, rotem. Unlike TEG, which uses skyline. It can be used in the presence of heparinization also, as the cups contain heparinase, which will counter the effect of heparin, helping to identify the residual heparin effect as well as rebound heparin effect after removal is happening. So the <coughs> graph you get is almost similar to that with a small light modification, and the wordings are also little different. There you said reaction time. Uh, K time, amplitude, here it is clotting time, clot formation time, alpha angle is the same, amplitude after 10 minutes, maximum clot formation, lysis, maximum lysis. So these are like different terminologies that are used and this is how that machine looks like. And uh, <coughs> this is another newer machine called Sonoclast, a vertical vibrating probe is inserted into only 0.4 ml of blood the impedance of its vibration is produces the plot and it is called a signature. So this is this again can be asked in the OSCE where you have to identify this uh, tone of plot signature is the way it describes. Unlike the cigar like graph of that, here you have the R1, R2, R3 prime and plot refraction and plot rate, all the things are done. And uh, then platelet function monitors are also now available which are able to measure the addition and aggregation uh, ability of platelet useful detecting aspirin mediated platelet dysfunction or von Willebrand disease. Hemodilation and thrombocytopenia may have produced 
And this is what this is how the Innovance TFK 100, which is a liquid uh, functional assay machine, which is available. Then clotting factors test, of course, you can do PT, APTT, INR routinely in the hospital at bedside uh, for patients on warfarin therapy and also for surgical patients. And the vascular endothelium, platelet coagulation factors are the backbone of coagulation. Balance between the pro and anticoagulation pathways is important for bleeding and thrombosis. Cell-based pathways seems to be the correct way to describe coagulation to replace classical pathway from textbooks. Diligent history taking is what is needed for majority of the patients. And this is time is not far away for POC test to replace traditional lab-based tests. This is what I said about five years ago during the presentation, and now. All of you know that thromboelastography has come into uh, as an important tool both intraoperative and postoperative, especially after the uh, liver transplant cases becoming more frequent. This has become the uh, <coughs> method of uh, identification. Okay.